Um, geese going over, seeing a lot of bunch of flocks of white fronted geese and snow geese. Uh, most of the ponds and stuff in our area are still frozen. I took a little walk this, today over on uh, at Gilbertville on the bike trail, and that is pretty much clear now. It's the snow's off. It's just a few spots of ice. I'd say by the end of the week, our bike trails and things around in the Cedar Valley are going to be pretty much open. Um, some of the water is just starting to recede a little bit over at Diagonal Marsh. There's, few uh, new waterfowl arrivals, but I expect to see more uh, in the, in later in the week. We'll start watching for some of our early sparrows and um, other things. I know down by Des Moines, there's getting some pretty good birds, so it won't be too long before they're up in, up in our neck of the woods. So keep your eyes peeled and it's a good time uh, to clean underneath your bird feeders if you haven't done so already from the winter, rake up all the chaff. Um, I got a vac I got my shop back out, did mine in my yard. It came up pretty darn good and got pretty, pretty clean, I think. Um, so we don't have a lot of news for, uh, for uh, right now for March, other than try to get out and get some exercise and get some fresh air and enjoy the sunshine. Uh, next week, we weekend, I guess we spring ahead with our time change. So Francis says we have um, uh, over ten thousand dollars, between ten and eleven thousand dollars in our account right now, um, and we're in good shape with the bird feeding fund. I think we're over seven hundred dollars for that. We should be able to make it through the end of the year with uh, what we have for our bird feeding fund. Our board will uh, be meeting uh, in a week. At four o'clock on the 16th, I'll send out the, the final notice on that to our board members. Uh, it'll be a Zoom meeting. And one of the main deals we'll be doing is uh, figuring out our grants. Um, so we've, uh, we'll put out a lot of the money we have in our bank right now is gonna disappear pretty soon. Um, <laughs> the grants are due on the 15th. And I'm not sure if Dennis is on, online right here, but uh, I'll have him send out those uh, grant proposals to our board members ahead of time if he can, for us to look at before the meeting. So you can kind of be thinking about that. And any of you that are watching now, if, uh, if, if you uh, are involved with the county conservation or city plans or so, if you are looking for some money for a, a bird friendly type, project or something that would go along with our Prairie Rapids Audubon mission statement, which has a lot to do with environmental education and habitat for birds. Um, check, check with us or, uh, or with, uh, with Dennis or on our, our website, we can get you some information and but those, those uh, grant applications are due on the 15th. Not that we would never give money out during the middle of the year because that's happened too if a good project comes along. So keep that in mind. Um, so Francis is uh, running the meeting right and uh, the basics of it. And Candace, if you haven't heard before, is out in Wyoming right now. And uh, we wish her well out there with her folks. And I think that's about all I have to say for right now that I can think of. Turkey vultures are back. Are they? You've seen one. Ah, many. Many. I, that'd be a new one for me. So for the year, I'll have to keep my eyes peeled. I think eagles are coming over too. And Tommy Stone said he had hundreds of them flying over on the, on the Cedar River. Anybody else been seeing any interesting birds or have some different sightings you want to share? You can unmute yourself and just speak. If not, we'll we'll get uh, we'll get started here. If you have a uh, a question, you can put those on the chat uh, room, and we'll bring those up uh, later after the presentation. And so we'll get we'll get started. Francis is going to mute you, and I think most of us we would like to see you uh, 
not see you. Um, you can mute, you can uh, stop your video, or just turn your screen off at home. And then as we get to the end of the meeting, you can turn back on. And uh, so we'll go with that. So, and I will turn my screen off too in a little bit. So we're welcoming uh, Jess Lanchill. Did I say that right, Jess? You're very close. It's Lancel. Yep. Lancel. Okay. It's a, it's a hard but, one. It's French. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jess came highly recommended to us um, for to, to share her passion with uh, mushrooms and fungi. And uh, that was a topic that came up last year when we were looking for ideas for programs. We had a number of people say, hey, it's time to do another mushroom program. So um, we're gonna welcome her. She is a, a Story County naturalist. She has a degree in uh, wildlife management interpretation from Iowa State, good place. And she's like an environmental director. Um, she's been environmental director throughout Iowa for the last 15 years, or you don't seem like you're, could be that old, Jess, from looking at your picture on the screen. <laughs> Been at it and, for a while. Yep. <laughs> and so she's been doing mushrooms since age four. So she's gonna have some good stories for us and some uh, interesting, maybe crazy things about the kingdom of fungi. So well, welcome Jess to the program, Fungus Among Us. Welcome Jess. Thank you, Tom, so much for having me. And um, yeah, I just wanted to remind everyone, if you have any questions throughout the program, feel free to type them in in the chat and Tom will interrupt me and uh, I'll try to answer what I can. I've already been throwing some doozies and I, I have to confess, I just don't know. Um, there's also the option of the raise your hand feature too if you um, can't get your question typed fast enough, but please feel free to interrupt me at any time if you would like to know more about a certain topic. So I'm gonna just kind of go ahead and here's my contact information. Um, what I can do is forward uh, the PowerPoint slides to Tom and he can forward those on to you. So should you wanna get a hold of me in the future. And as Tom said, I got my degree in wildlife ecology and management so I really want to specify that I am not a mycologist. As much as I love mycology, as much as I wish they would have offered that at Iowa State, they didn't at the time. So I consider myself a mushroom and fungus enthusiast, but by no means an expert. Uh, there are some of you on here watching right now that sounds like you probably know a lot more than I do. And um, that's okay, feel free to reach out. Uh, if I give any misinformation, I really hope I didn't, but I am always here to learn more. And where I've gained my knowledge is by basically life experience and talking to experts and going to different forays. And my, my passion for mushrooms really started, as Tom said, at the age of four, when my parents would take me out every spring for that great morel mushroom hunt. And it was something I looked forward to every year. It was like a treasure hunt for me. It was time spent in the woods. It was time spent with my family. It was eating those mushrooms at the table. And that really got me passionate about learning more about fungus. And, and I feel like it, it's a real Iowa tradition, especially those of us who you know, grew up more outdoors and in the country. I think we can all think of our, our mushroom stories for those of us that grew up that way. So my job is as a naturalist is to take kind of harder concepts and try to make them easier for other people to understand and to hopefully share that enthusiasm and get people out there wanting to go explore fungi, wanting to find mushrooms of their own. So that is my hope today. I'm just going to give a, a basic ecology about fungus, how it affects us, how the structures of it, and then I'm gonna end with some spring mushrooms that I get the most questions about. I get a lot of um, questions from the public about things they're seeing and they wanna know what they are. And in particular, wanting to know more about the morel mushroom and how to find them. So I, I'll focus a lot of attention on that today. So if you are wanting to seek out some experts, um, here are some good resources. First of all, 
in Iowa, in the, mid in the Midwest, we have this great group called the Prairie States Mushroom Club. And they do monthly forays and they pick a location in Iowa and a date and they meet up and you go out and you go collect mushrooms and you bring them back and use your ID books and, and figure out what they are. And they have some true experts at these forays. And I've attended a couple and I've learned so much. So if that's something that you're interested in, give this group a search on the Google, um, their website will pop up and they're, they're great group to join and you'll meet a lot of experts online. A good research, uh, resource I like to use is called the mushroomexperts.com. It's a great ID resource. And if any of you are on Facebook, there's some groups I encourage you to join. The Iowa Foragers, the Iowa Mushrooms, the Iowa Mushroom Club, um, the Iowa Morel Hunters. They give a lot of updates of when the morels are popping up and where. And then the false morel demystified. There's a lot of good information on there. And I've connected with some great, what I call fungus fiends and some really tremendous resources and people that really know a lot. So if I don't know, I can post a question on one of these forums and somebody gets back to me. So I encourage you to seek those groups out too. So I want to start out with why should we care about fungus? What is the big deal? Well, I have this philosophy that mushrooms will save the world. We could not exist without fungus. First of all, they're extremely um, widespread. You can find fungi everywhere. There's over 5.1 million species that belong to the kingdom. And now of that 5.1 million species, only 100 to 200,000 have actually been identified and given a genus and species name. So they are abundant. Our earth would be a stinky dump site if it wasn't for fungus because they have the very important role in our eco ecosystem as decomposers. So anything that dies, anything, you know, it could be feces, it could be, um, to, um, leaves on the ground, logs, you name it. Fungus are, are probably one of the more important decomposers to break that down and return it to the soil as good nutrients. And fungi also have this very important reaction or interaction called mycorrhizae. And think of this as, you know, the tree roots and the plant roots kind of becoming a team and working together. And if it wasn't for fungi, a lot of our trees and our plants actually would not be able to grow because those mycorrhizae associations are so important. And we'll kind of talk a little bit about that more later. Fungi are showing up in medicine all the time. We, a lot of us are aware that a lot of our antibiotics like penicillin comes from fungi, but there's great research about mushrooms being used for um, treatment of cancer, especially in its immune boosting properties. There is a mushroom that you could go out and find called turkey tail mushroom. Not really an edible mushroom, but it's very, very medicinal. And people make teas and tinctures out of that. And it's actually been shown to help um, boost uh, the production of white blood cells in your body. So that kind of increases your immune system. And I have some friends that have actually undergone cancer treatments and for breast cancer and you know, did the chemotherapy and your immune system was really, really weak. And I made them some tinctures and I gave them some of these dry turkey tails and told them to put them in their tea. And they, and they did that about three times a day. And you know, a, a month later, the doctors were just astonished by um, how much their white blood cells had increased. So, I mean, that's just anecdotal story, but the research is out there. So, Pretty interesting stuff. This mushroom that I'm featuring here that kind of looks like a pom-pom, this is Aramecium. This is called lion's mane. And there's a lot of great research about how this mushroom is being used to regenerate neurons in the brain. So it's used, being used to treat dementia and Alzheimer's. And this, this is a hot one coming out in science right now. We're going to be seeing that showing up a lot more, I feel like. And then John Hopkins University is actually studying psychedelic mushrooms for uses for treating depression and anxiety and schizophrenia as well. 
Fungi also play a humongous economic role. So this could be, you know, in a positive way or a very negative way. So a lot of our crop damage that's caused can be caused by fungi, things like smuts and rust and blights that can affect like our wheat and our, our corn. And that could, you know, has actually cost the global agriculture industry about $60 billion. So it's pretty significant. And, but you could look on the other side of that as well. And just yeast alone, which is a form of fungi, is a $900 billion industry. And you know, also playing in the role of our economics is, is of course food and also in, in nutrition for us as well. So you know, we get that from eating mushrooms and of course you know, the fermentation process in our breads and cheeses and alcohol. So we do use fungi in a lot of ways. So to get us a little more excited, I, I wanted to create kind of a um, true or false game for us about some questions um, um, or you could say even myths that I hear. Um, so things that I get asked a lot and people are like, is that true? So I wanted to test all of you. So the first one, most mushrooms are poisonous, so you should not touch them. So I'm just going to have you guys ponder that in your head. Do you think that's true or false? Mushrooms are poisonous, so you shouldn't touch them. So I get this question a lot, especially since I'm leading field trips and a lot of times with kids. And, you know, a kid will, as kids do, they see something cool and they pick it up and mom or dad go, no, 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 that's a mushroom, put it down, it's poisonous, it'll make you sick. And so that, that it, question is, is actually false. So though there are a lot of poisonous mushrooms, you're not actually going to be able to absorb those toxins through your skin. So there, there are very, very few exceptions to that. And the ones that are exceptions, we don't have around here. So it is perfectly safe to touch mushrooms. In fact, I love picking up mushrooms. I touch them all the time. The slimier and gooier, the better. And I love having kids do the same. And a lot of times when you're learning to ID a mushroom, you have to pick it up because you need to observe many, many parts of the mushrooms. Maybe those parts are underground. Maybe it's under the cap of the mushroom. So it's safe to pick those up. It's safe to smell them. A lot of mushrooms, in order to ID them, they actually have specific types of smells. Like some mushrooms out there smell like watermelon, some smell like apricots, some smell like rotting fish. Um, so the, the sense of smell is an important ID function as well. And in addition to that, taste. Some mushroom hunters, in order to distinguish um, the differences between two very much lookalike mushrooms is, is you break off a little piece of that mushroom and you actually taste it and you know maybe it's bitter and then you know to spit it out. Um, so you can taste that mushroom, spit it out and you're going to be completely fine. In order to get those poisonous toxins, you actually have to consume it and digest it. And a lot of the really deadly mushrooms are ones that you eat because and you absorb those toxins and they affect your liver. So completely safe to touch mushrooms, taste, um, to smell them. The only exception I would say to smelling is uh, perhaps a puffball mushroom because in the fall when they're really brown uh, and they're releasing their spores, you don't want to inhale all those spores. Sometimes that could give you an allergic reaction. Next one. Mushrooms only have nutritional value if you cook them. So you go to the store, you see those button mushrooms, you chop them up, you put them on your salad, you consume those and you say, yes, I'm getting my vitamin D, my vitamin E. Is that true? So you can only get nutritional value from mushrooms if you cook them. And the reason for that is, is mushrooms have a very, very hard cell wall that's made out of a polysaccharide called chitin. And in order to extract those nutrients from that cell wall and within the mushroom, you have to have an enzyme reaction like heat. So even when you are making tinctures out of fungi, you usually have to use some type of double extraction process to get all the nutrients out of that. So 
you can eat those button mushrooms raw. I know they're delicious. They add flavor, but if you're eating it raw, you're actually not going to get any of that nutritional value. So, and I always tell people, it's just a great rule of thumb to go ahead and cook your mushrooms anyway, especially when you're foraging wild mushrooms. The largest organism in the world is a fungus. Is this true or false? So I get asked this one by kids because they say the largest organism in the world is the great blue whale. And though that's true, it's the largest animal in the world. If you look for the largest living thing in the world, it's actually a form of fungus called a honey fungus. And you can find this in Oregon and it, it's mycelium, which is what you could think of as like the roots of the fungus underground actually spread about 3.4 miles. So it's, it's pretty amazing. Scientists tested it and all that mycelium, mycelium is genetically the same. So it is one life form. So that is actually our, our largest living species on our planet is the honey mushroom. And those are also edible and quite delicious to eat. So I wanna give us a, a basic understanding of what makes a fungi a fungi. And I wanna know what is the fungus's closest living relative? And if we look at this cladogram and we look at what branches off with fungi, you're gonna see it's animals. So fungi are more closely related to animals like us than they are actually plants. And there's a number of reasons why. So we know they're not plants. And the first reason is because fungi are not photosynthetic. They cannot take energy from the sun and convert that into their own food like plants do. They are eukaryotic, meaning they can be multicellular and those cells have organelles like nucleus in them. And as I said before, the cell walls are made of chitin where plant cell walls are made out of cellulose. As I said before, they are multicellular with the exception of yeast, which are unicellular. And mushrooms also lack the true root stems or leaves that plants do. And I'm also gonna give us a basic overview of the parts of the mushrooms here in a little bit too. Fungi are called absorptive heterotrophs, meaning they're gonna digest their food first outside their body, and then they're gonna absorb it. And they do this by releasing these digestive enzymes that breaks down that organic material or, the, um, or their host basically. And when they do that, they're gonna store that food as a carbohydrate called glycogen. And the fungi, the kingdom fungi is very, very diverse. You can have puffballs, you can have yeast and mushrooms and ruts and smuts and ringworms and molds. And I am going to show us a, a basic overview of all the major classifications of fungi, but I'm not going to go into them specifically. And as I said before, even our, our antibiotic penicillin is made from mold, which is a type of fungi. So when you are learning how to ID fungus and you're reading your ID books, a lot of times those mushrooms are going to be described by how they get their nutrition. And that can be an important way to um, observe that in nature and see what that mushroom is on. And that could help you identify it as well. So one way that ID books will describe mushrooms is as saprobes, meaning they're going to live on dead organisms and they're gonna decompose that and then recycle those nutrients back into the soil. So our, a lot of our mushrooms are decomposers and great examples of that are molds and our, as I said, our mushrooms. But some fungi are parasites, meaning they live off dead organisms. And when they do that, they're actually going to harm their hosts. So a lot of the fungi that negatively affect our agriculture are parasites. So like the rust and the smuts, they actually attack and harm those plants and cause that damage. And even we can even get human fungal infections. And a great example of this, especially if you grew up on a farm and around animals, you know, you might know about something called ringworm 
or you might know this if you were a wrestler or you know went to a, a gym where you, people share shower spaces. Um, it's a nasty contagious infection that forms a rash that looks like a ring and it's not an actual worm. It is a fungal infection and very, very irritating and hard to treat. The last relationship is would be mutualistic, which basically means like the host and the fungus are working together as a team. And you can see this very, very commonly in lichens, which we have everywhere. They grow on rocks, they grow on trees. Um, they're very, very durable and also incredibly diverse, just hundreds of thousands of different species of lichen. And that's actually a relationship between a fungus and an algae. Another example of this are, as I said before, those mycorrhizae. So the plants have roots, the trees have roots, and then the fungi grow on those roots. And the fungi are gonna help decompose that soil and provide those trees with nutrients. And in return, those trees roots are gonna provide the mushroom with some of those carbohydrates. And the, these mycorrhizae associations are really important because you're gonna see that when you start learning to identify fungus, certain mushrooms are only gonna grow near certain hosts. So for example, this is one of my favorite mushrooms to eat. This is um, called hen of the woods. It gets its name because it looks like um, the plumage of a hen and it, it grows very, very abundantly around the base of oak trees because it has that important mycorrhizae association with the oak tree's roots. And, and a lot of mushrooms very, very commonly have that association with oaks. Oaks are a great place to look for fungi, especially edible species. I'm gonna just take a moment to pause and make sure, did we have any questions so far that have come up? Uh, we don't yet, Jess. Okay, all right, Let's continue forward. So when we start to break down mushrooms and really look at their structures, um, mushrooms are basically composed of these long tube-like filaments that branch out and those are called hyphae. And then when a hyphae create this really extensive web or extensive mass and that begins to feed, we call that the mycelium. And the mycelium is the bioactive part of the hyphae. That is the part that does all the absorption. And mycelium take up a large surface area so they can do that absorption. And in fact, it's said that 80% of the earth under our feet is actually mycelium, which really shows you how abundant fungi are. I mean, 80%, that's significant. So if we look at this further, you know, here again, the mushroom's body is basically made up of that mycelium and it goes underground and then, or excuse me, the hyphae, and then that hyphae go up underground here and form that mycelium mass. And if you've ever, you know, put mulch down or wood chips down in your garden and you, and you notice something that kind of looks like this fuzzy spider webby mold growing across your wood chips, that's the mycelium. And chances are, if you come back in a few weeks and check on that, you're probably going to have some reproductive structures, fruiting bodies, called the mushroom sticking out and growing. Which brings me to what is the difference between a fungus or a mushroom? So basically the mushroom is the fruiting body. It is the reproductive structure of the mycelium. So all mushrooms are fungi, but not all fungi are going to create mushrooms. In fact, many don't. So I get a lot of questions asking me, you know, what is the surefire way? What is, what is a good rule of thumb to be able to determine if a mushroom is, is edible or poisonous? And that's a really hard one to answer because there really is no surefire way. There really is no rule of thumb because once you, you think you learn a clue, there's always exceptions. So when you're learning to mushroom hunt and you're learning to forage for edible mushrooms, 
the first rule you learn is you never consume anything unless you're 100 percent can identify it and if you're not sure you know contact an expert so you know when you're learning to id mushrooms you're, you're using your books and you're asking your experts and you're going through a checklist before you're going to consume that so there are many many edible species probably about 2000 known species but majority more of them are considered poisonous now that doesn't mean they're going to kill you or put you in the hospital but it could mean you know significant gastric upset for a day or two so there is no surefire way um, but i will try to to share some some clues that you can maybe use as tools so when you're learning to id mushrooms it's important to to learn the parts this is a, a very common depiction of mushrooms but any of us who have been out in a forest know we all know that mushrooms don't all take on the structure for example that hen of the woods that i showed you earlier that lion's mane that doesn't look anything like this but this is a a, a very common depiction and a very good start and easy to identify identifiable parts so we can kind of learn the basics so many mushrooms do have this cap on them and the cap is kind of like the hat of the mushroom and these can come in different colors different textures sometimes they're slimy sometimes they can be very spongy or scaly and you cannot go by colors to determine if it's poison or poisonous or a lot a lot of people think well if it's brightly colored that may, that's a warning that's a warning not to eat it well that's not true either there's many brightly colored mushrooms that are absolutely del delicious to eat for example chicken of the woods is a, a vibrant vibrant orange mushroom whereas an amanita can be a vibrant vibrant orange mushroom so the colors can be used to warn you but the colors are also can be used to attract animals for consumption to spread their spores as well so you can't go by color to determine if a mushroom is edible or not and the whole cap's job is to either grab attention or deter attention but mainly to protect what's underneath of it and those would be the gills and the reproductive structures so some mushrooms will have gills some will just have um, spores or excuse me pores that look like a sponge or some can have teeth like that lion's mane i showed you so th these can all look very very different and this cap of the mushroom is being held up by what we call the stipe or the stalk and that's whole function is to get that cap and those reproductive structures out of the ground high enough so a mechanism like wind could travel underneath it and spread those spores it, it helps get those spores released from the parent plant now these next parts of the mushroom like the ring and the vulva not all mushrooms are going to have that structure but i'm going to talk about it because it can be a characteristic to help you distinguish if maybe you are finding something in a more toxic toxic mushroom family but again as i'll explain there's always exceptions so i, I want to show you guys this feature here and this feature here a little bit further so a lot of mushrooms especially in the amanita family can start out as the structure looking like an egg and maybe some of you have seen these growing in your lawn or in your garden in mulched areas okay and this is the death cat mushroom. This is one of the deadliest species of mushrooms you could eat um, would, definitely, would definitely result in death. And so they start in this egg shape and this what's covering it is not an egg, it's called a universal veal. And some mushroom books are going to describe this as an ID characteristic. And if we look inside you can see the cap of the mushroom starting to emerge kind of like a chick catching out of an egg and that veal's job is to protect the mushroom body until it has all the nutrients it needs to start growing and we can see here 
it's starting, here's the cap starting to emerge out of the egg or the universal veal. And here you can see the veal still attached. And it's the stalk is starting to grow out more, the veal still attached. And now here's the vulva here. This is what's left of that veal, but there's still part of the veal up here as well. Now it's protecting just the gills where those important spores are. And as this continues to grow, and become more and more what we could call ripe, that veal is gonna completely detach then and then leave this ring, okay? So if you ever see a ring around a mushroom like this, it could be a clue that you are in the Amarilla family or the Amanita family. And the Amanita family tends to have the more toxic mushrooms in it. Again, there are always exceptions and there are exceptions to some mushrooms that are edible and do have that ring. So you can't always go by that, but that might be a good clue, a good indicator. So I wanna show you this again. So if we look at that, here's that partial veal and now you can see it's starting to expose those gills more. And as this grows, that veal is gonna become a, a ring that we call an annulus that will be hanging out down here. And again, there's that bottom part of the mushroom, the vulva here. So here's the vulva and here's that ring I'm talking about. If you've ever seen stink horns growing in your garden, um, they have those same structures, also not in, it's not an edible species. Um, I love these mushrooms though, because they have just this incredible structural diversity. So if we look at this one, this one's called the bridal stink horn and there is this partial veal and, and it's just tr beautiful. And some of these partial veals, they can look like baskets on the ground. They can look very nest-like. So just amazing looking mushrooms here. And I always get questions too. Like some people will, will see a cap emerging like this and they see the stringy stuff and they think a spider did that or maybe a silkworm or maybe it's mold growing on the mushroom that's still that partial veal. It hasn't detached yet to reveal those, those gills. Its job is still to protect those gills because they're not ready. So that's what you're looking at there. And as I said, some of these can be good indicators of what kind of um, mushroom family you're finding. Jess, we did, um, we did get a question here. Great. I have to back up just a little bit. It was a uh, uh, what kind of animals eat mushrooms besides humans? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, you know, one species, one animal in particular is squirrels. Squirrels love mushrooms. A lot of people don't know that about squirrels. They just assume they eat nuts and corns and things. But um, mushrooms are a very, very important part of their diet. And deer. I also see um, deer munching on mushrooms as well. So quite a bit of critters out there will consume mushrooms and especially um, insects and things of that sort too. But commonly around here, uh, squirrels, if you were to look at a squirrel's cache, a lot of times they have dried mushrooms in them. It's a great question. Any others? No. <laughs> all right. Okay. So all of this that we've been talking about so far brings us to the most important part of the mushroom and, and that is the spores. And spores are a very important adaption to life on land. And the whole purpose of a spore is similar to a seed. Um, it's just to get that species dispersed to new locations. It is the reproductive part of the mushroom. They cannot move on their own, so they are going to rely on water and animals and insects and wind to move those spores around. And depending on the dispersal mechanism it's using, it's going to determine the shape it's going to have. So here is a puffball mushroom. This is called a gem studded puffball in its drier later stages. These are edible when they're nice and white and fresh. And puffball mushrooms just release trillions and trillions of spores um, in, in one season. So I always tell people that if you find a, a, a puffball, especially if it's in your yard, let it dry 
and let it get to that brown stage. And, and then when it's nice and brown and dry, go kick it around your yard and come back next year. And you can have about 10 more, 10 more puffball mushrooms. And then you can slice those up and eat them and give them to your friends and just keep them growing. You know, assuming you want puffballs. I always want puffballs. I think they're delicious. So, and what I wanted to show you here is a, a video of some cup fungi and these fungi get their names because of their cup like shape and what i love about these mushrooms is if you find some cup fungi in the woods and you hold it up to the sun or you even just blow on it it'll it'll start to steam and what it's really doing is releasing those spores so i wanted to just show you a video of this real quick And where I work out at McFarland Park, we have some trees that have, um, oops, oyster mushrooms. I'll just show it to you again, it's fun. And uh, those oysters are high up in the tree. And, and one day it just looked like this tree was on fire because it was just like it was smoking. And when I looked, the sun was hitting these mushrooms just so directly that it was causing them all to just release their spores. And it was just really, really pretty to watch. So. If you're seeing some steam and you're not sure what it's coming from, you know, look down around you or look for some fungi, that's probably what's happening. And what I find really interesting about the mechanism to release these spores is, is scientists have done studies on these, this mechanism, and it's actually the greatest acceleration of G-force ever recorded on our planet. So to put this in perspective for you, when we send people to outer space, those astronauts are experiencing a G-force about, of about four Gs. Well, the mechanism these fungi are using to release the spores is about 180,000 Gs. So just, just incredible strength to, to get these spores to release and, and even to just travel 13 feet, you know, 180,000 Gs, that's pretty significant. So mushrooms and fungi can, can reproduce sexually or asexually. And I, I wanted to give you a very brief um, understanding of, of a life cycle, a very simplified version. It's a little more complicated than this, but I feel like this is a, a easier depiction to understand. So basically what you have is a uh, mature fungi or mature mushroom here. Here's the fruiting body. And this one's showing gills and those gills are going to release the spores. And hopefully, you know, wind will cause the spores to travel a great distance and, and land somewhere where it's nice and damp and good nutrients. So then those spores can start to release some hyphae. And then when the two types of hyphae find each other, usually a male or a female, if we were to give them a gender or a sex, then those hyphae would merge together and then create the mycelium. And that would do the, the abs uh, nutrient absorption and branch out even further. And then if the conditions are right and there's enough nutrients that would start to grow the mushroom again. And when you start to learn to identify the fungi all the ID books are gonna have them classified into different groups. And the way they choose to classify those fungi are based on their reproductive structures and what they look like. So for example, members of the group Basidiomycota are called the club fungi because of their basidia, their reproductive structures. They think those look club-like. Or the ascus mycota called the cup fungi or sometimes called the sac fungi because their ascus are very cup shaped. So when we look at the different groups, it's, it's all based on um, their reproductive structure shapes. So these are you know, the seven main classifications of fungi. And as I said, I'm, I'm not gonna describe each one and, and how they're different, but if that is something that interests you, when I send out those PowerPoint slides to um, Tom, if he shares those with you, I've detailed those things, but I mean, that would be 
pretty much a semester of mycology to really dive into that. So we're just going to keep it basic. And um, some of the ones that I haven't really talked about, like the citrides, these are um, aquatic decomposers, the family of Detrimycota, you know, for example, there's that ringworm I was talking about. This is, this is a parasite. Our, our molds belong to the group Zygomycota. And then some books will classify the mycorrhizae and the different lichens as fungi as well. So what I wanna talk about now, if we don't have any questions, is um, some questions that I get very, very commonly in the springtime that people are coming across, you know, what mushrooms they're finding. So I, I picked some that I get the most questions with that you're gonna be the most likely to encounter in this early spring. And I'm not gonna to touch on, I mean, there are so many mushrooms I would just love to talk about, especially a lot of the edible species that come around in the fall, because that's when I feel like fungus foraging is, a, is, is best. So um, if that interests you, I usually do a fall fungus program in Story County around September time. So check out our page and maybe you can come do a little foray with us. But this is going to be the ones we can find this spring. And I'm gonna start with the one I always get the most questions about, the morel mushroom a common Iowa tradition here. And I don't know about any of you, but when I grew up mushroom hunting, you learned that there's different stages of mushrooms. So when you go out really, really early in the season, you might find what we call the little gray morels. And then as the season is about mid season, you start finding the yellow morels. And then as you get to the end of the season, you find these giant yellows that are the size of an ice cream cone. And if you look at different ID books, these are all gonna be classified in different species of mushrooms. And what we're most recently is coming out is all these mushrooms are essentially the same species. They're just in different stages. So for example, the gray morel is just an immature form of the yellow morel. So now scientists are just kind of classifying these and grouping them all together and calling them Morcella Americana. And it seems like there's still some debate on this, but the most recent things I suggest is these are all the same species. They're not different. They're not genetically different. So that's what I'm gonna go with today. So this is a spring ephemeral that's gonna show up depending on weather conditions, it could show up as late as, or as early as late March and go towards the end of May. But once they start popping up in your area, they're typically are only gonna last about three to four weeks. Again, all based on temperature and weather conditions. So when the nighttime soil temps are consistently between 40 to 60 degrees, that's when the, the temperatures are starting to get really perfect for these mushrooms to start popping up. Um, but if that soil temp gets too hot, then they're gonna stop growing in that area. So it's a very, very finicky mushroom and can be very, very difficult to find, especially in the early stages because they camouflage so well within the ground. And a lot of times, unless you find a really special honey hole, they're not going to be prolific. You know, you might find one in one spot. You might, but if you find the right spot, you might find, you know, 20. So it can, it can really change based on where you are at. And it seems like this is also a mushroom that's been very, very difficult to establish a cultivar of. So growing at home has been very, very difficult to, to get this mushroom to, to proliferate. And you know, there is some belief that it's because of the special mycorrhizae interactions that these might have with their surroundings. So if you're thinking about, okay, I'm not sure what the soil temps are. I'm still not sure if it's the right time. There are some other indicators going on that you can look for. So one of the things that you will hear said is if when the oak leaves are the size of a squirrel's ear, 
that's a good time to start looking. Um, when you're hiking around in the woods, if you notice some of this, um, these plants called may apples, and they kind of look like little umbrellas, green umbrellas growing out of the ground, um, that could be a good indication that the soil temps are right and you're in the right area for morel mushrooms. I always went off of when the, the lilac bushes start to bloom. And that was, is kind of an indicator that it, it's in the best time for mushroom hunting as far as temperature. And, you know, for me, that always seemed to happen around Mother's Day. And that became a Mother's Day tradition is when we saw the lilacs blooming, we knew it was, it was time to go hunt the woods. As far as where to go, you can go to any woodland and you know you can search around oaks, aspens, uh, dead elms is always been a, a common belief with finding these mushrooms. Um, some people say apple orchards are a great place to look. Uh, after a prescribed burn, check those areas because there's a lot of good nutrients in the soil, but also the vegetation is really low and they're easier to find. But, you know, sometimes I, I have found these mushrooms also in the most random places like rock piles and under pine and cedar trees. So it, it's a, it's a peculiar mushroom, but absolutely delicious to eat. And, you know, these things can typically get sold from 15 to $80 a pound, depending on the season. So they're definitely sought after and absolutely delicious to consume. There are some lookalikes out there though. So what I wanna talk about is how to tell the difference between this mushroom and some of the lookalikes. Um, oh, I forgot to mention too, uh, another good tip of this as well is in the early season for mushroom hunting, um, start with south facing slopes typically higher on the hill. And that's because that's gonna get the most sun and the most heat. And then as the season starts to get later and later and temperatures get water, warmer, you're gonna to wanna to go further down the hills, try checking north facing slopes and really, really shaded areas and especially mossy areas. So that's another good hunting tip for, for the season. So how you're gonna identify these is you're gonna look for this kind of honeycomb cap. I always tell kids they kind of look like brain on a stick. And the, the inside of them, when you cut them open are going to be completely hollow. And that's a really important ID characteristic. And when you look at the cap, you're gonna see it's fused directly to the stock. So it's important to know those because there's also another species of morel out there called the half free morel. This is still edible, but this edible species does have a poisonous look alike. So the way you can tell with this is the cap is very, very short and kind of dumb like. And the stock almost has a three to one ratio to the cap. So the stock is really, really long and usually I find these before I do the morel mushrooms because they stick out so much higher out of the ground. And it's a, it's a great mushroom to find because even if I don't want to eat this mushroom, though I could, um, I know I'm in the right area. So if this guy is growing, that's showing me that the morels are up, I'm in the right location. And when we look at this and we divide it in half, we're gonna see that that cap kind of goes halfway past the stalk and it's also going to be hollow inside. Now, normally if for new mushroom hunters, I just tell people don't bother with this because the half free morel has a very, very close look like that's the true false morel. And it's not in the Morcella family. It's a Verpa bohemica and people call this the early morel because sometimes these come up even earlier than the actual morel species. And as I said, it's not a morel species at all, which is why they're called the false morel. And, and I hear people call the next mushroom we're gonna talk about false morels, but th those aren't false morels. These are the false morels. And the way we can tell the difference 
is if we look inside, first of all, it has this cottony filamenty mass inside. It's not hollow. And then if we look at the cap, that stock goes all the way up to the tip of the cap. So it's gonna be easier to see this in the next slide here. So here's our false morel. If we look at it again, there's that cottony stuff inside. And then that cap, the stock goes all the way to the top of that cap here. Compare that to the half free morel, again, hollow, and that cap goes kind of halfway down the stock. And then our regular morel species, again, completely hollow, and the cap is fused to the start of the stock. So two of these are edible. The false morel, I hear debates among different forums. Um, some say if you cook them well enough, they're edible. Some say if you um, eat these, too many of them, you're gonna, they're gonna put you in a very drunk-like kind of psychedelic state. Um, some people say it's gonna really upset your stomach. And it all depends really on the, on the consumer, on, on, on the person that eats it. Because, you know, for example, the true morel here is an edible species, but if you don't cook it, it's very much poisonous. So in order for this to be edible, you have to break down those enzymes and get those toxins out of it. And for some people, even the morel can cause serious gastric upset. I could eat these every single day in large quantities and be completely fine. My coworker, she only has to eat one and she will spend her day in the bathroom just absolutely miserable. So it all depends on the person. So if you are trying a new mushroom species, I always tell people, if this is new for you, first of all, make sure you thoroughly cook it and then only try one. You try one and you wait six hours and you're completely fine, try a few more. If a couple of days you're still fine, you're probably not gonna have an allergic reaction to that, to that type of mushroom. So if it's new to you, start small and work your way up and, and make sure that you don't have a re allergic reaction to those species. So my next mushroom here is what a lot of people call fa false morels, but these are actually called gyomitres. And they're humongous, they grow, again, the same time as those other species in the same habitat. If you find them, it's a great indicator that you are in the right location to find those morel mushrooms. So as I said, they're not in the morel family. And when you break these open, they're um, not gonna be hollow. They're very kind of cottony inside as well. And they're also very, very brittle. So some people um, call these beef steaks and there's a lot of debate on their edibility as well. Um, many forums say, go ahead and eat them. Just make sure you cook them properly. But for new mushroom hunters, you also really need to know which type of gyomitra you're identifying. So the two in Iowa that are um, considered possibly edible is the gyomitra brunia, which looks a little more flatter, almost like elephant ear-like. And then the Carolina, which is much more brain-like. And, and a lot redder in tone where the other one is orange. Um, again, I, I've, I've heard people say they're delicious, never had any issues, but I've also had people say that it gave them a lot of gastric upset. So I, I say they're debatable because usually I don't hear about many people having reactions to like morel mushrooms as I've heard people having reactions to these. Now, the reason why you really want to be able to identify these is um, we're pretty safe here in Iowa, but there is another lookalike of this that's a giant mitra esculante, which has a much larger um, composition of this, of this compound called giant mitra. And why that is an issue is because when you heat this compound up, it creates a reaction that basically makes monomethohydrazine which is what is basically used in rocket fuel. 
And some people cooking that type of mushroom, even from absorbing the fumes, even smelling those fumes during that cooking process has put them in the hospital. And deaths have been associated with that type of mushroom. So it's not common in Iowa, but it, people have found them. These are definitely the more common ones. So it's one of those, I always just extend caution and say, make sure you 100% know what you're, what you're cooking and about to eat. So any questions about these so far before I move forward with some other new mushrooms for us? No questions. All right, well, as I said, feel free to interrupt at any time. So this one is another one I'm getting lots of questions about. Um, it's kind of a new species here in Iowa and we'll talk about why. But um, uh, this is the golden oyster. And you know, when you break down its, its name, it, it basically means yellow capped mushroom. And you can find this mushroom in uh, the spring throughout the fall. It's very, very prolific and, it, and it's delicious edible. Um, and here in Iowa, we have two species of oyster mushrooms. Um, you have this golden variety and then you have this white variety. And the white variety is the one we've, we've most commonly known. And it gets this name oyster mushroom because they really do look like just a, a bunch of oysters together. So this golden oyster though, this is not native to Iowa. This is actually from Russia and China and Japan. And the reason why it's here and, wh and why we believe what happened is in 2011, we had that hurricane Irene and somebody um, had cultivars of this mushrooms growing. And when hurricane Irene came and flooded that area, it took all these spores with it and put it into the surrounding habitats. And this mushroom just absolutely took off and started spreading. And it's starting to be classified as an invasive species simply because it spreads so abundantly that it's actually out competing our white oyster mushroom. At least that's what they believe. So it's gonna be really interesting to see if, if we're gonna to have to start treating this as an invasive species. I, I don't know if we're going to have to start treating areas or, or what's going to happen or if we're just going to let it go. Um, it, in my eyes, is kind of a good invasive species in the fact that um, a lot of they're easy to identify, they're easy to find, and they grow so abundantly. And what's great about oyster mushrooms is if you find a spot like this, you can go out and slice a bunch of these off, leave a little bit behind. And every few weeks, as long as you're getting good, moist, warm weather, it's going to keep growing back and growing back. And I, you know, at my park, I have a few trees there that I, in the summertime, I check every few weeks and, you know, I have my, my dinner for the week. So um, that's, what's really cool about this mushroom. And not just, you know, throughout that season, like you can come back the next season and the season after that and, and tell that, you know, they've gotten all that nutrients from the tree. So it was fun mushroom for that reason. It's a great, easy ed edible as well. Another one I always get questions on is what's called pheasant backs and dryad saddles. A lot of people are finding these when they're morel mushroom hunting. Uh, they grow in the same habitat. They're a great indicator that you're in the right area and that there's enough moisture for mushrooms you know, you have to think that um, mushrooms, 90% of their content is water. So they need a lot of rainfall in order to grow. And these are called pheasant backs because of the, the color and the pattern that they have on them kind of rem reminds people of a uh, bird's plumage. And then some people call them dryad saddles. A dryad is a fairy, so fairy saddles. And as I said, they're found in the same time and location as uh, the morel mushrooms, even found on dead elms where morel mushrooms tend to like to grow by. And these are edible, but you don't want to eat them when they're this size. At this size, they're very, very hard and leathery and 
would be very, very difficult to consume. But when they're about the, the size or a little smaller of the palm of your hand, they're nice and tender. And they have, when you pick these, they kind of smell like watermelon rind or cucumber. And they carry on that flavor when you cook them. They're a very, very sweet flavored mushroom. And you're gonna find these, you know, all throughout the fall. So they could start in the spring and then you, you know, I can find them in even through late fall, which is, you know, with the morel mushroom, you're only gonna find for just a few weeks. I love this mushroom. They're called scarlet elf cups. And I love this mushroom because they grow so abundantly and it's one of the first odd mushrooms that people notice when they're hiking in the woods because they're so brightly colored and you know they're just they're just cute little fungi and there's several different types of species of this scarlet elf cup that only a really um, dedicated mycologist would be able to know the the microscopic differences on and um, these are saprobic meaning they're decomposers and a lot of times you can find them on just specific types of, of twigs. So for example, they're commonly associated with like growing on basswood twigs. But as I said, there's always exceptions. You can find them on hickory twigs and oak twigs as well. And some books do say these are edible when cooked. And, and I, I even know of some species in Europe where people eat them raw, but I always you know like to follow the rule of thumb of of cooking your mushrooms. And that way you still get the nutrients from them as well. But this is one you'll, you'll probably find real early this spring, even in areas where there's still snow on the ground. So that's what you're looking at, the scarlet elf cups. So the dog sting corn, again, we kind of looked at this earlier and I, I, the reason why I love this mushroom is just because of, of the diversity of it. it. It's got some just really unique features. And, and this one's called a dog stink horn because of its resemblance to a certain male dog's body part. And I get a lot of calls and pictures sent to me like, what is growing out of my garden? Because these guys love wood chips and mulch. So they're you know, a lot of, a lot of well manicured mulch areas are going to see these popping up and people have a lot of questions or what are these egg things because they start with that universal egg shaped veal. And, you know, some people don't like them because they are called a stink corn because as they're growing and start to essentially decay in order to release their spores, they emit the scent. And that scent is used to attract flies. And then it can be a very, very unpleasant smell, almost like rotting meat kind of smell. But that's how their spores are spread is by emitting that, that stinky smell. So this is one you're likely to come across. And as you can imagine, it is not considered inedible. And as you look at it, you probably wouldn't dare to try it anyway. It's not exactly an appetizing looking mushroom. So the one I wanted to end with are a species called the boletes. And these are a, a really neat family of mushrooms and they're, they're known for having a cap that is um, porous underneath. So you're not gonna see gills. This can be very sponge-like and, and has kind of a velvety cap texture. And then its stalk is, well, stocky, basically. It's very, very fat. And what's neat about these is there's many edible species of boletes. For example, the porcini is an example of a bolete. Um, there are some toxic species, but not deadly. I mean, poisonous as in like could give you some gastric upset. But what's cool about these mushrooms is some of them, especially if you notice some that are yellow, that if you cut them open, they turn this beautiful blue or purple color. And I wanted to show you guys this. And that was one of the slower kind of bruising ones. Um, some of them, it just turns blue immediately. Some of them you can write your name 
in the cap here and it would turn blue, you can make designs. So um, really, it's really, really beautiful and really neat. And it's believed because when an animal bites into that, that oxidative reaction is going to taste very, very bitter and discourage the animal from consuming it further. And a lot of people think that if it bruises, that means it's toxic. And that's not necessarily true. There are some edible species of bruising boletes as, as well as inedible. So you can't always go by that. But a really neat mushroom. And if you see, you know, a stocky um, stem on a mushroom with that porous underneath, I encourage you to just, you know, cut it open and see if it turns those neat colors. So those are, you know, the ones I decided to talk about today. And like I said, there's many, many other just incredibly unique mushrooms out there to find, but these are some of the ones that I hope I can get you enthusiastic about finding this spring. And, and as I said, if you are really into fungus foraging, uh, I would encourage you to look up some of the fall species because that's, in my opinion, some of the more tastier and easier to identify mushrooms as well. So I'm going to go ahead and, you know, ask for questions and hope I'm able to answer them. And if I can't, I'll send you to the right place to get your answers. Well, Jess, we do have some uh, questions and a, a couple of comments, too. All right. So I'll, give a, I'll give the comments uh, quickly first. Um, the DNR website has an article. Uh, let's see where to go. There it is has an article, 50 Tips to Spot Morels by Mike Crable. Who, oh, yes. Who yeah, will be, incidentally, will be a Zoom speaker at Hartman Reserve on May 9th. Excellent. You might put that on your calendar. And check out his new book, A Forager's okay. Life. <laughs> Forager's Life. Yeah. Crable. Hope I pronounced that right. Yep. And then um, also, um, somebody asked if, if there'll be a recording available for the public after tonight. There will, all our programs for the year have been, uh, are being recorded and will be available. And uh, this one might be, uh, Candace will put it on her website um, when she gets back from Wyoming. So it may be a week or two before you actually see it there, but it will be there. Um, so a, a couple of questions, one, um, are we allowed to harvest fungi in state, county, or city parks? Are there guidelines to harvesting in public spaces? And I might add to ethics, you know, about how much should you take? That's a great question, and I'm glad you asked that. Um, so as foragers, it is always important to read the rules and regulations of, of any county park of any state park uh, or any public place and um, many parks for example i know in our in conservation county land um, we say that you can take mushrooms you can take berries you can take nuts but you cannot carry out plants and you cannot dig up plants and so a great example is um you could go to our one of our parks and you can you know take all the morel mushrooms you can find but if you come across this other plant that grows around the same time and is absolutely delicious called a wild leek or ramp um those those are protected plant species are are protected so you would not be able to dig those up or collect those and if you know we caught you with those you know you would you would get a citation or, or a fine um, so that said, you could, you know, if you get permission from a private landowner, you, you can take those things. So the, the other question is, you know, the ethics of that. Um, what is harvesting too much? So another foraging rule of thumb is you take a third of what's available and only in areas where it's abundant. So this is, you know, Again, going back to that wild leek, if you're in a, in a private place and you see a bunch of wild leek, that would be a good area um, to harvest from and you would leave a third. So a third for wildlife and then a third for um, plant propagation. Where that gets tricky can be the mushroom hunting because, you know, for example, with morel mushrooms, you might be searching for an hour and you get a spot and there's only two morel mushrooms there. Well, how do you leave a third of that? Um, you don't, you just take them. You know, if I'm in an area where I, there's a lot of morel mushrooms, 
I, I tend to leave a few um, just because I want more and more spores to release. I want to be able to hopefully go back to the spot. You know, if, if I notice there's a mushroom that's kind of been chewed on or might, might be a little older or drier, you know, um, I feel good about leaving those there. If you are, for example, with those oyster mushrooms, those are quite abundant. So it's easier to leave a third, you know, you can slice off part of it and leave a lot for on the trees. Cause again, wildlife is going to enjoy that. And then it helps with the propagation. And then also, you know, it's ecological role out there of being a decomposer. So um, I hope I answered that question for you. Mm -hmm. Are, are a bracket or shelf fungi edible? It depends on the shelf fungi. Um, so a lot of shelf fungi are considered are called polypores. Um, so it, you know, for example, there's one called the artist conch. It gets this name because kind of like that bolete on the underside, you can draw on it and it'll stain black. Could you take that home and just slice it up and eat it? Uh, no, but you could throw it into a pot of boiling water and turn it into a broth. Um, you know, some polypores, uh, some are called beef steaks, not to be confused with that Jayamitra species. Um, they have a roast beef flavor. Um, some polypores are called chicken of the woods and they have a very much chicken-like consistency and those are edible and delicious. Um, but there's also many that are considered inedible. Um, they're kind of been known to be the um, safer species. There's not any that I can think of that are considered poisonous, but a lot of them are just so leathery and tough, you could not consume them regardless. So it really depends on the shelf fungi. Are there any mushrooms that are endangered in Iowa? Ooh, I have no doubt there are, but I, I don't know which ones. So maybe Mike would know that one or um, somebody on one of those forums that I showed you, maybe they would know. I'm sure there are, but I, I couldn't point, point one out. Maybe, maybe just me thinking here, maybe it would be a mushroom that's a, um, symbiotic with a, a a rare plant or tree. Absolutely. That's in yeah. danger. You know, that might be a thought. Yeah. Um, that, that's all for those, those questions. We had a couple of comments earlier about birds that people have been seeing. And if you have a question, go ahead and put it in. We'll look at that come up. Um, people have been hearing kill deer. Uh, we've had um, cedar wax wings coming around and juncos still. Red-headed woodpecker coming to a feeder. Um, there's like cedar waxwings on Grand Boulevard and Cedar Falls and berries on a tree, 40 lesser scalp between on the cedar between George Wood and Hartman today. Um, and then uh, there's been a report of a rough grouse at the disc vault, disc golf um, course at Big Woods Lake in the shrub south of Big Woods Lake. Uh, that would be interesting there. Um, let's see. I don't see any other questions. Um, questions, Tom? I, I thought one thought is, is, you know, when people sometimes collect morels and they'll have a mesh bag and you were thinking that you're, um, spreading the spores if, if you collect it, is that, is that true or is that work or is it end or what? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of debate on that one too. Um, there's definitely a specific time when those morel mushrooms are more prone to releasing um, their spores. And chances are by the time you've picked that mushroom um, and you know, from that time to by the time you get it into your bag, you've probably already released a lot of the spores and, and they're on your clothes and you're dispersing them that way. Um, I think it's a, just a, a great gesture regardless to use the onion sack um, to, you know, whatever spores are remaining to yes, to help spread those around. But, um, you know, a lot of mushroom hunters too, what they prefer to use are, are the baskets and avoiding plastic bags just because 
um, that makes your mushrooms contain, you know, basically enclose all that moisture and heat and can get them mushy and gross and, and, and also like get them a lot dirtier as well. Whereas a basket just helps you maintain better specimens. And, um, so if, if you're out going mushroom hunting and you don't have an onion sack and all you have is, is the plastic bag, use what you have. Like, I, I don't really think you're going to hurt anything. So yeah, there, there's a lot of debate on that one. Hey, Jessica, could you put your, uh, your contact information back up? Sure. Um, let me exit here and bring this back. Here we go. And another thought on uh, morels, you said the grays were like immature. So if you found a bunch of grays and you left them there and then came back three, four days, they turn into yellow ones. If you left them there longer, they get to be those gigundous ones. Right. <laughs> so, and this is where, you know, I, I say challenge to the literature because I have definitely found little grays and left them and they did not grow. <laughs> um, <Dude. laughs> So, but they say that they are genetically the same. So I see challenge, but that's what current literature says. But I, you know, I'm with you. I, I have left them and I have come back a week later and I was like, you are still the same size. So <laughs> yeah. Jessica, Jessica, yes. have you ever had any experience with harvesting inky caps? Yes, I have. So I'm assuming um, because there's there's two different varieties of what people think of as inky caps, but the Caprina species, which is known as like the shaggy manes, is that what you're thinking of? Yes. Yeah. I love the shaggy manes. Those usually come out in September. Um, absolutely delicious. Uh, again, what she's talking about is this mushroom um, that when, as it matures, it basically decays in a way that it's just like rotting ink. And in fact, people use these as ink, um, collected that. So it's got this very, very short growing phase where you can pick them and they're white inside. And you know, within a couple hours, they actually start to bruise and brown and they're not very good. So you have to consume them very, very quickly, but they're absolutely delicious. So how, how do you prepare them? I, um, pretty simply, you know, some people like to just turn them into a soup. I like to saute them in some garlic butter and then put them on my pizza. That's my favorite okay. way to eat them. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> Can't go wrong with garlic and butter. Yeah. That, absolutely. Absolutely. We had a comment here. Um, I heard, I just heard about fungi bags that you can be buried in. <laughs> and, you decomp and you decompose into the soil right nice. right what do you think i said go for it there you go. <laughs> why not who wouldn't want to be put back in the earth that way yeah I, and they do that for like around tree roots too i heard yeah i i mentioned to jess before the program started I just finished a, a recent book on uh, fungi and it kind of leads leads into that. One of the last chapters is talks about fungi products this company out east, where they actually make building materials, uh, fungi leather, clothing, mm -hmm. and such. And the name of the book is uh, Entangled Life, mm -hmm. and it's pretty interesting. And it has probably about eighty pages of notes at the end, so it's pretty well researched. Um, Merlin Sheldrake is who wrote it, but kind of a good, good read follows up a lot with what Jess had. Um, in that book, Tom, did they, um, talk about all anything at all about mushrooms being used for, um, the whole bee colony collapse? Yes. They talked about, uh, lichens They talked about the hyphae where they use those in, in uh, slime molds, I guess, which is not actually a mushroom, I don't think, where they use those hyphae to, to figure out um, transportation routes in Japan. 
believe it or not. They, really? They can find the they can find track ways. It's it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And most of what they talk about is below the ground. But they covered a lot of things like you talked about today on your program, which I'm gonna say with I think with our a, a lot of viewers, we had probably 50, 60 people watching the program today. It was just an excellent program, Jess. It's so thorough and very interesting and fun. Yeah. And I can't wait to get back out there. I know I'll be looking at maybe trying some of these um, mushrooms that I haven't before that I know what they are. I'm one of these guys that ate morels for years and then had a few and then also I got sick on them and, and it's kind of unusual. So maybe your body changes in time. I know mine's changing every minute, I think, <laughs> as you get older, but. Yeah, um, I've heard stories of that too. And yeah. Yeah. But uh, it's just a fantastic program. We'd love to have you again someday um, in well, person great. at one of our meetings where we have yeah. treats and things afterwards in Cedar <laughs> Falls. But uh, were there any other questions by anybody else or comments? I have one other question. You were talking about the uh, golden mushrooms and uh, we've often found the uh, white oyster mushrooms and just a couple of years ago, all of a sudden, we started seeing the golden ones pop up on our property. Even on mm -hmm. um, George Witt on our birding. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and as we've been birding with, with our group, we would see the golden. Uh, is it likely that we'll not see the white ones anymore? Or uh, That's what's in question. And I can just say anecdotally from my own observations, I, I'm... I'm not seeing as many as of the white oysters now, but the golden quite prolifically, and they are competing for the same resource and habitat. And, and as most invasives go, they tend to outcompete our natives. So I, I do fear that that will be the case. Now, yeah. what would be the reason though that they would outcompete? Do you have any idea? That's a great question. Um, you know, it could be just in the habitats where they are from, they're, they're hardier, they're, they have to um, proliferate faster because of conditions. So that, you know, kind of adaptation is brought here to a, to a species that maybe doesn't um, create as many spores as fast or is a little more subjugative to weather conditions. Um, I'm sure there's a really good explanation why that's just kind of one of my theories is, um, you know, it just could be like, you know, it's a, just a better survivalist. Yeah. Okay. I know I was really surprised to see them and I thought, well, they look like oyster mushrooms, but I better check it out before we ate them. But yeah, you're good. Yeah. <laughs> They are good. They are good. And, and in some ways, I think they do taste better than the, the white ones. And that might be because the goldens are a little bit smaller. So they're a little more tender and easier to cook. But hmm. thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions right now, Jess, or comments. So we'll, we'll uh, thank you. And there'll be a check in the mail coming pretty soon for you. And uh, we well, thank you for this wonderful program. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you, everybody, for, for uh, being here tonight. And we'll look forward to uh, next month, where our feature will be uh, Hartman Reserve on a video tour of the new areas there in the new facility. And most importantly, on um, plants and native things that you can do in your yard, how to improve it to attract pollinators and birds and uh, beautify your yard. So kind of a dual uh, program by um, Katie Kluse, the naturalist there. Um, she's a um, vivacious speaker and has a lot of knowledge. We'll look forward to hearing her next month in April. So thank you for your support.